So it's fantastic to have this um, position as moderator in our, in our final panel for the day. It feels actually really quite sad to be finishing off the day. Um, and we do have, fortunately, Phil Cleary giving us, I'm sure, what will be a very sort of um, enthusiastic and emboldening conversation to go out the door with. But certainly we've got a fantastic panel here um, to, to follow on from Ken Lay's speech this afternoon. So we've got actually leaders of organisations that are influential um, and who are creating leadership um, in the area of gender equity um, and violence against women. So it's, I think, a very, um, a very um, important way of finishing the afternoon to be broadening it out in this way um, and to be able to be thinking in, um, in very positive ways, moving from the very personal to the organisational um, in thinking about how we extend um, our, our reach into the community and how to try and escalate and, and to make the change faster than it's been so that we're always just talking about the slow pace of change. Wouldn't it be great to be talking about the fast pace of change? And um, so we're looking forward to having our panellists talk on this subject. Um, now, we've been thrown a quote. So I'm going to ask um, the quote to be put up and it's a challenging one, and I think it's it's great. It's a terrific quote. I was very um, excited to see this quote by by Beck Zajic. In recent years, we've we've seen many high-profile people, including Victorian Premier Dennis Napthine, urging us to say no to violence. What we have not seen is these same people taking a public stand against the sexism and gender inequality at the root of that violence and in favour of the feminist tactics that work to demolish it. And frankly, trying to stop violence against women without feminism is like trying to fight cancer without oncology. It's not going to work. So I thought, I mean, one of the things I've thoroughly enjoyed about the morning that I've been here has been this sort of completely um, unapologetic way of talking about feminism, sexism, patriarchy, it's been very um, encouraging, I've found, and very liberating as well. So that I've enjoyed that totally because so often we're having to use and use other forms of language. But nevertheless, there are enormous challenges in this language and I will be asking the panel um, to address some of those. But first of all, our panel has five minutes each to be able to, to talk about the work that they've been involved with. And we're going to, I'm just going to introduce the panel. We're going to be starting with Janet. Janet Menzies. Janet is the manager of Male Champions of Change, an organisation of 25 of Australia's most senior leaders focused on increasing the representation of women in leadership. So that's, um, I, th this is going to be exciting to hear from, um, from Janet and talking about her subject and her organisation. Um, we've then, I'm going to be speaking with John O'Brien. John is Head of Industrial Relations for National Australia Bank. Uh, he's worked in um, industrial relations for a long time, but he oversees the National Bank's recent implementation of a domestic violence support policy for their 28,000 workers Australia-wide. We'll then be talking with Paul Hamilton, who is the Regional General Manager for AFL Central Victoria. He works with his commission in developing the Australian game throughout the region. Um, and he is also a past Essendon player, as you will see um, on your, um, in your um, program. And we'll also be then following on um, with Libby Davies, who is the current CEO of White Broomin Australia. And Libby has a stellar um, a, st a, st a stellar CV in the whole area of um, violence against women. She's and also leading in a range of other community sector organisations. She's currently a director of Lifeline Australia and member of the New South Wales Domestic and Family Violence Council and a member of the New South Wales Preventing Domestic and Family Violence Social Investment Advisory Group. So 
It's a terrific panel that we've got, and um, they will be broadening out this conversation. So starting with you, Janet, over to you. Is it on? It's Beautiful. on. Well, first of all, um, thank you uh, for inviting me to speak today. And I, I, was, I was delighted when I got this particular quote. Um, I've really benefited immensely from listening to all the conversations this morning, from the different breakouts to the keynote speakers. Um, so thank you as well for that. I, um, as Kathy mentions, I work with the Male Champions of Change, which is a group of 25 CEOs that was created in 2010 by Elizabeth Broderick, our uh, sex discrimination um, commissioner. And um, I'm going to say, and I, I I hope there will be supporters in the room that I, I completely support um, this quote. And I actually would say, uh, go even one step further, and I would say that for real change to happen, not only do we need to have people taking a public stand against gender inequality, but we also need to have uh, leaders working to increase the representation of women in leadership. And what I thought I would do is just to spend a few minutes of, of speaking about the male champions of change of just one strategy that, um, that might be of interest to you. Um, as Margaret from the Center for Nonviolence talked about um, today, violence against women is both the cause and consequence of gender inequality, right? We know that, and I know I'm not telling you anything new. And in our society, um, where unfortunately unpaid caring work is not, does not have the value, it sh is not valued as much as it should, one of the strong indications of gender equality is leadership within the workplace. Um, when Liz Broderick came into her role initially, she um, was an extremely strong optimist, as I am. I share her optimism. We both have that trait in common. Um, and she really believed what she needed to do to increase gender equality, and particularly women's um, representation and leadership, was mobilize her network to join with groups like you're gathered here today, and that change would happen. You know, she really believed that. And one of the things that happened is in 2010, she was looking at the data. And, you know, I wouldn't be telling you anything by saying that, you know, the data does not lie. The statistics hadn't changed at all, especially in workplaces. And so the Male Champions of Change strategy was formed through that insight that, well, through an, a very simple insight that, um, you know, we are not going to, we, women have been leading on this for a really long time. They are responsible for the potential gains um, and the potential for women to lead organizations. However, those who hold the levers of power, especially in the corporate world, are overwhelmingly male, right? We have 3% women CEOs in the ASX 200. We have 40 boards of our top 200 companies that have no women on the boards. We have less than 10% of executives that are women, and many of those are important, but non-core, you know, outside of operations in the support roles, important, but not on the path to CEO, um, generally speaking. And um, her insight at that point was, if we want to achieve greater gender equality in the workplace, we need to mobilize men. So she picked up the phone, um, and she asked 10 CEOs that she, some of whom she knew, some of whom she, she knew only by reputation, and she said, will you join me in elevating gender equality um, onto the agenda, onto the national agenda? Will you help find solutions? And I think that she, um, you know, she was very lucky at that time because um, obviously there had been lots of groundwork. There were lots of men looking for ways to lead, but um, what we do, unfortunately hear from the men is that they didn't have a place, they didn't feel they had the right place to express it, they didn't have that safe space, they had fears around whether they were worthy to actually take on a leadership role when it came to creating gender equality. Um, what I might do is talk briefly about how this works, because I would imagine there's some people in the room at this point who are saying, oh, it's the patriarchy brought to life. You know, we have 25 men who get together and talk amongst themselves about how to achieve gender equality, right? Champions, how, you know, this is sexism brought to life. Um, and I guess what I would like to reassure you is that although early on that was very controversial and deliberately controversial, um, you know, I don't track all these CEOs, I don't know what they do in their spare time, but none of them are wearing capes. You know, they're not out there on, they don't view themselves as white knights. What they understand is that they, um, 
they have a responsibility as senior leaders to take on take leadership positions and that the way they'll be able to do that is by listening to people who have expertise um, by learning about what what it means to create more a more gender equal role and then taking action and that really for them has started within their organizations um, so look this is just one of many strategies um, you know most strategies are led by women um, but I suppose what I wanted to just really um, point out that I think that you know not only th a strategy like this is built on built on the work of feminists and not only does it need to be work on gender equality, but it also needs to happen at the core of where our society is built, which is in the workplace, and therefore seeing more women um, re reaching leadership levels. So I might just um, pause there and allow others to speak. I've got, you know, there's lots of more I'd like to share and, and explore with the group when it comes to time for questions. Okay, thank you very much, Janet, for kicking us off. Um, Speaking of kickoffs, no, we're not having Paul next. We'll, we'll go to John. Okay. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to um, speak here today on behalf of the uh, National Australia Bank. And I think, as the title um, of this conference, it's everybody's business. We believe in NAB, at NAB, that as a large major employer, it is important for us that we can and we should, and we believe we do, take a leadership on gender, gender and diversity issues. Um, if I could just highlight a couple of the initiatives that we've taken over the last few years. We've conducted, and I think we're the largest company can, to conduct pay equity audits. We've conducted those in accordance with um, the finance sector union, the union that represents our employees, to look at those issues that um, you know affect uh, gender pay equity in, in our workforce and we've conducted two of those and have acted on many of those initiatives. In our most recent enterprise agreement, uh, we provided that superannuation contributions continue to be paid on unpaid parental leave and also that unpaid parental leave be recognised uh, for long service leave purposes to try and deal with that particular issue and we see that as a leading type of, uh, we're lead, trying to lead the way in terms of dealing with those gender equity issues. And of course, we have our well publicised um, domestic violence support policy, which has received a, a lot of publicity. Um, at NAB, we are well aware that domestic violence affects one in three women and during the course of their life, and that two thirds of these women are in paid work. With a workforce of around about 28,000 in Australia, the problems that confront society generally will impact our employees in roughly equal proportion, and we do employ a large number of women. Our policy is designed to provide a supportive workplace, and we provide access to a number of services, and provide paid leave to deal with a variety of issues that may, arrive, uh, may arise in, in, that, in that situation. And I would add that that is uncapped um, paid leave. So, you know, unfortunately the policy has been used a number of times since it was implemented over a year ago. But we think it is imperative that, uh, you know, the purpose of the policy is to support women and provide guiding principles for the organisation to follow when dealing with such matters. We are aware at NAB that financial independence is important and crucial for employees and women surviving a, um, a violent relationship. So, um, like the conference title, it's everybody's business. We believe it's our business as well. And uh, as Janet mentioned, it's a, it's a workplace issue. We believe it's a workplace issue. We hope that NAB, that we can play an important role in addressing this very important issue and that um, by the stance that we're taking, other companies will come on board and it'll just uh, flow right throughout industry, not only the finance industry, but industry generally become the norm so that we're you know, contributing our part and accepting that it is everybody's business. Okay, John, thank you very much. And so over to Paul um, to talk, in, talk about an AFL perspective and the things that you've been doing there. Yes, uh, look, it's, uh, I, I look back, I walked into an AFL club, I was over 25 years ago, very male dominated domain. Um, there wasn't one other, there was one woman and that was a secretary to the general manager, the only one in the whole organisation. Not that it was a huge organisation at that time. Um, 
when I last left an AFL club, it was uh, it was very much a changed environment. It uh, there was board members that were female, there was dietitians, there was trainers, there was doctors, there was administrators, there was people throughout the whole organisation. And this gets to the heart of the gender equity area because when I walked in years ago, there was no doubt it was not a welcoming environment for females. There's no doubt that the, there was a lot of sexism in the storytelling. And the story, when you talk about culture, in workplaces, culture in football clubs, culture in wherever you are, a lot of it's about the stories, the storytelling. And some of it can be, can be positive and some of it was positive, but there was a lot of storytelling at the time when I look back, very incredibly negative um, and wrong. I find now you don't quite have the same situation at the AFL clubs because they have addressed a lot of these issues. A long way to go, I've got to say that too, a long way to go. But a very different environment, and the reason for that is there's a lot more gender equity within that organisation, which is just another workplace. And that changes and has changed the way the conversations are and the ability to be a welcoming environment. Our challenge, so my, my role now is, uh, so I'm general manager for AFL Central Victoria. So it's this region, it's Bendigo and beyond. It's in the regional area. And we talk, and I, I, I'm always inspired when I, when I hear from Ken Lay. I think he's, uh, he's a terrific leader. And we do need good, strong male leaders in, in this space. Um, one of the areas we have to, um, we have to find ways to break through. And I think gender equity is, is one of the key areas. But how can we get there quicker? How can we make things happen? And I think one of the key things is making sure that every type of social environment and the ones that I will be focusing on because we have some control over them are the football netball clubs in this region. How can we make sure and ensure that they are safe and welcoming environments for people to go to? How do we go about that? How do we find the leaders to stand up? And it is all about the leadership and it is about the male leaders within those clubs. It is the coaches that kids look up to as they're growing up. It is the presidents, it is the captains, it is the people of influence within clubs. We need our leaders to stand up. The stats are horrific. The way it is, it's something that's been hidden, I believe, for way too long. It's coming to the forefront. We have to make sure it comes to the forefront in the places that matter, where you can get cut through. We think you can do that in sports clubs because we've seen change in other areas. We've seen change in racism. We've seen changes in alcohol. We've seen a few other different changes in different areas. This, this, this issue um, is more important than any of those, I believe. They're all very important. And um, we have to find ways of tackling them. We run programs at the moment which are about respect and responsibility. Um, we just, I think we just have to make them even sharper than they've ever been before. And we need to seek out that leadership. And there is, there is always good leadership within groups. We have to find it. We need people to stand up. We need people to have courage. And that's what we'll be pursuing moving forward. OK, thank you very much, Paul. And over to you, Libby. Well, it's good to see gender diversity in the panel. I think there was a comment. It's a good um, start, isn't it? It's a good start. <laughs> <laughs> a very good start. Um, the White Ribbon campaign evidences very much that men are taking a stand in this issue in Australia, in addition to much of the other work that's been mentioned in this conference, such as No to Violence. Um, the evidence of men's engagement and the evidence of men's conversation in this space is certainly something that I, as a feminist from many, many eons now, um, have noticed, and particularly so in the last 10 years. I guess I've been around the community services sector and the education sectors um, now for over 40 years, and it, it's very obvious to me that we have come a long way. And I, I, I want to emphasise that we don't lose sight of the fact that we are making progress. Men engaged in the campaign, getting back to the, the quote that we have, absolutely acknowledge that trying to stop violence without feminism would be like trying to fight cancer without oncology. It's not going to work. They're committed as any. Those that we engage with in the White Ribbon campaign, those that become White Ribbon ambassadors, who undergo a very rigorous recruitment process, part of which now involves a compulsory e-learning module about what is violence against women. 
they are as committed as any women feminists that I've come across in my many years. They're very cognizant of what, for example, Bob Peace refers to as patriarchal constructs that drive violence against women. They want to be active agents of change and are deeply concerned about the embedded sexism and constructs of masculinity that fuel that violence. And these are the conversations that they have with us as part of this campaign. As women feminists, I'm not sure we've been very good at engaging with men. And we've not very been very patient in our methods of engagement. We've created walls around feminism that have been very exclusive. Feminist action, and it's great to see this, is now recognising that we have to be better at including men in feminism. But most importantly, we have to give them the tools, the understanding and the strategies to actually make a difference, to deal with the subliminal sexism and gender inequality that continues to fuel violence against women and about which this conference. Yes, leaders are saying no to violence, but they're not just the leaders. They're men from all walks of life in their respective spheres of influence that are key to having the conversations that we've heard so much about. What White Ribbon as a campaign since it's come to Australia, now in its 11th year, has done is allowed men into the conversation, but it's also enabled them in the conversation. And I guess I've, I'm old enough to witness that this wasn't the case. I felt in the 70s when I was a, a rabid feminist at university, very much felt that men were absolutely excluded. I don't remember any on-campus meetings around gender and equity where men were involved. It was all women, which seemed to me a strange, almost a strange conflict. Here we were trying to change behaviours around gender, diversity, constructs of masculinity, power and privilege, but we weren't talking to the men. We were talking to each other who were the converted. As Esther Sola, founder and president of Futures Without Violence in the US, has said, what we found that national polling said that men felt indicted and not invited into the conversation. I'm afraid from where I sit in the White Ribbon campaign that this is still pretty much the case. 2013 UN Commission on the Status of Women had a focus on men's violence against women. But I didn't see many men in the room in any of the sessions I went to. It was the women who were having the conversations. However, they were acknowledging that men needed to be actively engaged. And what the White Ribbon Campaign is doing worldwide, and particularly here in Australia, is building on and acknowledging the amazing work of feminism led by women and feminist men and giving men agency in feminism. So they become agents of change. It is giving them tools to, refre to reflect on very long-term ingrained learnt behaviours that overtly or inadvertently reflect male privilege and power and then to work to change the attitudes and behaviours through the places that matter to them in the sporting field, through the CEO champions of change, in the workplace and also in their own home. We are at a place in prevention now that I think is really exciting and that is we're more than just taking a stand, we're more than community readiness, we're more than community awareness, we're actually doing things, giving those strategies and tools to men that are beginning to make a difference. The programs of prevention independently evaluated are built on what Esther Sola and others identify. They meet men where they are at and give them tools to recognise and act. As I've said, in our schools, our universities, in the community and in our, in our workplaces. And White Ribbon is beginning to see the social impact, gathering the evidence that these tools and strategies built on the composite knowledge and collective wisdom of many years of research, best practice, understandings are beginning to drive attitudinal and, as a consequence, behavioural change. And we've certainly seen that in the White Ribbon Workplace Accreditation Program and we have the evidence 
to support the claim. And we will continue to gather that evidence. And White Ribbon's not gathering it. We have independent evaluators to do that. So that the measures of change in the places that matter are beginning to see the change. So we're evidencing that men are very much being independent um, in this process, but are given the tools to do so. White Ribbon has been built on the strategies highlighted by Jackson Katz, the bystander approach, by Michael Kaufman, the originator, one of the originators of the White Ribbon campaign in Canada, by Michael Flood, Bob Pease, our eminent researchers here, and many others in this room and elsewhere, who identify that men want to be active to fight violence and then tell them how we should do that. But in seizing the moment critical to give campaign leverage, we are building on the feminist tradition, and we never forget that, and working with men to assist them to understand, for, our, for example, how their entrenched behaviours, those learned behaviours, those learned constructs of masculinity, including their language, are very much part of the problem. It can con degrade, it can control without them knowing it. And even the most liberal of men are reminded of what needs to change. I'm often saying that in my house after 40 years of marriage. So the statistics are working. And we've seen the community really gather behind this, Just, and I'll finish on this point. We have over a 204% increase in community engagement in the White Ribbon campaign in the last two years. And that, to me, says something about community readiness and community preparedness to actually drive the tools of change. And of the 24 organisations that went through the first tranche of the White Ribbon Workplace Accreditation Program, building also on all the best practice referred to, it touched 55,000 men in the workplace. And as a result of that, we saw a shift in positive attitudes towards, for example, the unacceptability of using sexist jokes in the workplace, a first step. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Libby. A stirring, you know, so it's, it's interesting to see and hear, isn't it, the different perspectives from key leaders in different organisations. So I want to return to language and just talk a little bit more about language because it seems to me we have had a lot of discussion about language over, the, um, over, the, um, over this conference because I thought it was interesting to talk about notions of feminism, notions of sexism, notions of patriarchy, and they're sort of writ large in that. And I just wondered if I could throw it to John to talk about, would you use the language of feminism in gaining and making the case for change within NAB, or what do you think and how do you interact with their language? I don't know if we'd use the term feminism specifically. We generally use terms such as diversity and inclusion, authenticity and respect, teamwork. They're the sort of, because our diversity and inclusion areas include number of, you know, whether it be sexual orientation, mm -hmm. disability issues, a lot. So we, the, the sort of language that we look at is diversity, inclusion, and treating auth everybody with authenticity and respect. And that is their key behavioural principle that we, that we get assessed on. So every NAB employee, whether it be the CEO or the teller in Timbuk, you know, out of West, would would get assessed on um, what their behaviour, uh, what their behaviours are, and authenticity and respect is one of the key okay. behaviours. So over to you, Paul. Can you um, respond to the same question in your role in terms of leadership of the AFL, gender equity issues? Yeah, I, I think um, I think language is important and. Uh, but I also think you need to be very clear on who your audience is at any particular time. And, and that's the key. So I think you can use feminism and use those words and use those terms in the right audiences. I think uh, in, in the instance where we're going to, um, particularly in regional clubs, and, uh, and we're going out there to talk, we want to make sure we're getting change. We want to make sure we're getting cut through. And, uh, and with that, we talk about, uh, we do talk about respect, respectful relationships. Um, we do talk about uh, welcoming environments. We do talk about what does constitute um, violence, um, because there's a whole range, as we all know, of what that means. Or, and we talk about empowerment, we talk about those terms. And I suppose that's the audience that we're, we're going to, and that's the, that's the language we'll use. 
different in different environments. I think, uh, and I think that's well, that's that's really with any type of communication. You need to be aware of your uh, your environment, and you need to make sure that you're getting the message through and you're getting the cut through. Okay, and um, Janet and Libby, would you like to comment on this as well? I know you've already said some things about that. Are there, are there some more issues you'd like to talk about in terms of language? I mean, I think the language one, I think that any of the male champions of change that I work with would be honoured to be called a feminist. And in fact, you know, with David Morrison, with 1.2 million hits on his YouTube video, and you know, when he was called a feminist icon, he couldn't have been prouder. Um, but I, I agree that I think one of the things we think a lot about is how do you engage the head and the heart? And I think that sometimes to engage the heart, you need to move down to the very specific about um, you know, things like what it will do to increase their business success, what it would mean to their uh, employee welfare, how they can um, build a legacy. So I think um, it, part of it is figuring out you know, what will engage their heart, which will then lead usually, I think, to more action and to more confidence around that action. I think the other thing that's been missing around the language conversation is um, how we engage with our youth and what is the language that we use in social media. We ran a, a forum last year which was funded by a small grant from um, Telstra actually uh, around engaging young people in this issue of violence. We've also conducted a survey um, of 4,000 young people across Australia, the analysis of which is currently being undertaken by UNSW and that will then compare with the young people cohort as part of the Community Attitudes Survey, and we're going to look at the comparative analysis of those two groups, um, the Youth Action White Ribbon Survey and then the NCAS Survey, and look at w how do young people actually relate in 2014 to this issue of violence, and what is the language and the strategies of language that we need to engage to assist the work that we're doing across this whole continuum um, with young people from early childhood through schooling um, and on into their early 20s. So that is something that I think we haven't done a great job of. And you think about the analysis of social media. For example, we know that men are more likely to use Twitter and women are more likely to use Facebook. So how is that influencing our strategies and the languages that we use in those mediums? Okay. Now, I'm also aware that we've got a very large audience here, and I did wonder whether there are a couple of people that wanted to ask our panel a couple of questions. So just if you had a couple of points that you would like to um, put to our speakers, then we might just um, also invite any particular questions from the floor, if there are any. Yes. And you, would you like to just name who you are and... Um, Uh, my name's Julie Flynn. I work uh, from uh, Castlemaine. Um, I'm interested, Janet, in your comment about the lack of confidence that the CEOs had to bring about change in their organisations. And I was initially surprised to hear you say that. It was interesting to hear that the main, one of the main strategies you've worked on is capacity building for them. What other strategies have you used to support them? Um, thank you for the question. I first want to say I think that when Liz first started the group, she was um, she chose carefully, and so I would say that um, I wouldn't want to insult the members of the group to say that they all needed capability building. But I do think that what they've gained from the group um, is just more time to contemplate it in a different way. The main strategy that the group uses is that you know there's quarterly meetings, two hours in length, no delegates allowed. If you can't if you can't make it, you uh, your organization's not represented, and if you miss very many meetings at all, you can't. Very extensive peer pressure, and I think that's so. The first thing is the structure of the work. The second piece is I think that we make. Um, I think Liz has done a good job of designing. Um, very effective peer pressure, and I'm sure that others on the panel and you, many of you here have done the same thing. You know, when, um, you know, I can think of situations where I remember being in one meeting um, early on um, where one of the 
champion said, you know, I don't think I have a pay gap in my organization. I, I just don't understand how that could happen, right? And um, I, I usually, I don't actually talk that much in these meetings at all, and it's not because I can't. I talk, they, I talk to them a lot outside of the meetings, but you know, what we did, and I think Liz does well, is she was very quiet, right? And then one of the men said, and it was actually Ralph Norris from CBA, he said, listen, I tell you right now, you've got a pay gap. So here's what you need to do. You go back to your organization, I want you to pull your grads now, and I want to pull your grads from three years from now, and I want you to look at male versus female, and I'm going to call you on Friday, and I'm going to ask you, do you think you have, do you want to change your answer about whether you have a pay equity gap, right? And you know, this is a very decent man that was saying, I don't think I have a pay equity gap. And so I think one of the strategies that works well is to have men problem solving. And it was very funny because, for me anyway, because after the meeting, you know, within five seconds, I've got the head of HR calling me saying, oh my goodness, my CEO's calling me because apparently Ralph Norris is gonna come on Friday and I have to pull this together and, you know, what do I need to do? And, and you know, and she said, I've been talking to him about this issue for a really long time. And it seems like there's, you know, and she said, am I ineffective, Janet? I said, you're not ineffective. It's just that he needed a disruptive jolt. He needed to hear it from a different source. He needed to hear it from another bloke. <laughs> You know, I, I, look, I think that, yes, although I think that women, one of the really important parts of the strategy is listening to women, because their experience is what is at the core, but yes, I think that's true. Okay, I'm, um, I'm thinking too that maybe there is this issue, and that I'm gonna throw this one as well, which is, it's a delicate balance, really, isn't it? Bet and Rodney Blaze talked about it, I thought, very eloquently, and I think Ken Lay did as well, about what's the balance and how are you finding the balance between providing men with leadership roles in the violence against women arena versus taking them out of that role? And, you know, I, I guess I feel quite strongly about this. You know, recent, there was, a, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, you know, we had a key launch of a very important report on community attitudes. And, you know, it was a male researcher who hadn't been central to that, you know, who'd been on the periphery, who was fronted, and the women who'd worked for years getting that up, and I worked with one of those women who got it up, they weren't even named and acknowledged at the launch. You know, and I just think we've got to be so careful. You know, this is someone who's you know, very out there and very sensitive to these issues, but it's so easy for it to happen. We do it almost without realising that we're doing it. So I'm just wondering whether you've got some thoughts about that and, and that role and, and how you find that balance. So I'm just throwing it to each of you um, because we've only got a few minutes left. So, um, John, do you want to start? It's not something I've really turned my mind to in life, but we would expect our senior leaders to, whether they're men or women, to, to lead the way. Mm. And that it's, it's, it's a leadership role at the bank. Mm. It's a leadership role, it, it must come to the top and flow right through. Mm. Um, we have got a number of senior women both on our board and on our executive committee. But we see that you know, it's, it's leadership, it's a fundamental part of leadership to promote an inclusive, non-discriminatory culture within our organisation, and we expect, you know, that, that that leadership starts at the top and flows through. But it's the it's the tone from the top. We have all our leaders, either male or female, involved in our all our training and our our um, we do a lot of online training and a lot of videos about respect and what we expect of um, you know the behaviours of our employees and. To call mm -hmm. from the tone from the top. Okay, Libby, have you got a, any thoughts about this? Because I imagine it's one that is continually an issue that you're managing, working with, struggling with, balancing act. We do, st uh, uh, the campaign absolutely struggles with the notion, um, I think, or the perception by many, and many feminists and many people in this room, we, some, we feel like we walk on eggshells because we're empowering men to be active agents of change in this space. So many feminists, or some feminists I should say, or some groups, have felt, in, felt that, ah, oh, here we go again, male privilege, 
Mal stepping up to the plate, Mal taking leadership in what we've been doing for the last 60 years. I was like, okay, so men are stepping into the campaign now and taking over that whole campaign. There's been a perception that that's what was driving White Ribbon. And from my internal, where I sit, yes, I'm a female CEO at the chair, and the chair of White Ribbon always has to be a male White Ribbon ambassador. Mostly in the media, we try and have our male White Ribbon ambassadors speak, and they absolutely appreciate the delicacy of the male privilege and the construct of power that can be misconceived by them being actively engaged in this campaign. So the campaign itself, the training that they do, and the, um, the elements um, that sit behind the support of the White Ribbon Ambassador are to break down that notion, any notion that might exist. And sure, there are some White Ribbon Ambassadors that say things and I go, oh, I just cringe and I think, no, that's not on message, that's not on script. But then that gives an opportunity for you to have a conversation with them as to why that's not the case. So it is a very delicate balance, but it is something um, the White Ribbon Ambassadors that are, you probably see a lot of in, in um, various, certainly Ken's example of one, for example, absolutely know where they're coming from in terms of deconstructing power and control. Um, so I guess the other comment I would have is that the, the scenario you described to me just sounds like a mistake, right? A well-intended mistake because, you know, to not acknowledge those involved um, would definitely not, you know, fit with anything we would aspire to. Um, I think the, the funny thing is, not funny, but the sad fact is, is that when it comes to corporate leadership, um, I actually think that um, it, it is so male dominated that um, it, it, they are almost expected to speak. And so in some ways what, what we're doing is arming them with, um, with the tools to do it better. But I will say that you know, a scenario that I run into quite often is that the male champions of change will speak. You know, they do 150 events a year speaking about women in leadership. And we will have um, a, a you know, a thousand people, let's say, in our forum every couple of years come together. And um, it's quite nerve-wracking to decide who comes to that event. Because, you know, I'm very conscious, and the men are very conscious that they have a, a privileged position where they can transmit their knowledge to others. And yet they also want to acknowledge the women who have contributed to the journey. And they also don't want to get into a situation where the women, in general, are less senior than the men, right? And if, and if you bring together a corporate audience where you're trying to be 50-50, which is what we always try to do, we, are, we really need to be thoughtful about how do you bring together, how are you inclusive um, without being, you know, um, without being accused of being insincere. So I think that, the, I guess the message I um, would just share with the group is that I think that if you were to go back and certainly look at the male champions of change, you would ha find lots of, and I'm sure White Ribbon and all of these corporations, you would find lots of mistakes made and lots of situations where, you know, um, they have not been perfect. But I think we need to believe in the optimism that by them doing more, that it 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 will create more cut through. Um, so I, I know it's not really an answer, but I I choose the belief that by them doing more, they will get better, and they will get better at acknowledging like that that scenario wouldn't occur because that man would say, you know, I'm only doing it if it I can get it to a place where it's comfortable for everyone and equitable. Mm. So, yeah. Paul, a final word from you because we do need to close up the panel. Yes. So, over um, to you. Yeah, look, I, I think on that topic it is, yeah, you are always looking at where are you going to get the results? Where are you going to get the cut through? Who do you need to lead those? But I think it's the way you go about it. And I think the great leaders, the, the, the good leaders, are people who involve others, um, who do put others up um, quite often to, and, and look for the results at the end, but acknowledge people, bring people together, and that's men and women. And I think that's always the best way to go about things to, to activate change. But also looking at who will have uh, the most cut through for a particular incident at any particular time. So I think that's, in, that, that's important. And I, I just wanted to finish on peer pressure, I've gotten mentioned before, and uh, 
course, when we hear peer pressure, it's, uh, it's, it's, well, it's often with a negative connotation. Um, in fact, I interviewed a 92-year-old lady uh, going back three or four years ago, and I said, what's the great thing about being 92? And she said, oh, no peer pressure. <laughs> <laughs> But of course, that's the negative connotation we've got. And I think um, peer pressure can be really positive too. And that's very much, and particularly for in a male, and particularly male-dominated organisations, if you can get positive peer pressure, that's where you get change. And that's what we need to happen. And that's where we need to see the leadership. OK. Well, look, thank you very much. And thank you very much to our panel. Um, I think you've done, you know, you've really opened up this issue, you've talked about it in, in thoughtful and reflective ways. And I think it does, you know, having um, people in leadership positions in organisations um, here on the panel talking about gender equity, talking about feminism, and talking about the, the role that has to play in the violence against women agenda is a really important coming together because in some ways we've siloed off the gender equity issues from the violence against women issues and bringing them together has been what this conference has been about. It's been you know, a celebration of that and it's been actually, I think, part of conversations that we need to have to continue to bring these um, agendas together in ways that will enrich both, both these issues. So thank you very much to our panel.